Today we're going to review the female reproductive system and the menstrual cycle. The female reproductive system consists of two ovaries, the oviduct or fallopian tubes. Oops, where did it go? Let's bring this to the front. Uh, there we go. The oviduct, the uterus, and the vagina. It's in the ovaries where the eggs are housed, mature, and are released in a monthly cycle. When an egg is released, it's pulled up into the oviduct, which leads to the uterus. It's in the oviduct where fertilization usually occurs. The uterus is a highly vascularized muscular organ that houses the growing embryo in the event of a pregnancy. It's also called the womb. In the uterus, we also have a cycle called the uterine cycle which is a monthly buildup and breakdown of the endometrium wall, this highly vascularized tissue inside the uterus. At the bottom of the uterus is a circular muscle called the cervix. It separates the uterus from the vagina. Outside the vagina, we have the external genitalia, consisting of the labia and the erectile tissue, the clitoris. Let's take a moment to focus on the ovaries and the process by which eggs are produced and released. Egg production is called oogenesis, or the creation of eggs. It actually begins before a woman's even born. Every woman's born with all the eggs she'll ever have. In fact, she's born with many more oocytes than she will ever use. Each of these potential eggs is in a state of suspended animation until puberty with when, with the initiation of the menstrual cycle, uh, she begins to mature one at a time each of these eggs. During each cycle, one egg will mature and be released. The process will reoccur with regularity until a woman reaches menopause, then, uh, then the end of her reproductive years. Let's look at the actual process by which an egg is formed, oogenesis, and contrast it quickly with the process of spermatogenesis that we learned before. We know that for a gamete to be produced, a diploid germ cell, in this case the primary oocyte, has to undergo the process of meiosis to produce a haploid gamete. Haploid. In this case, an egg. However, there's a little bit of a difference here between what happens with this and spermatogenesis. Let's take a quick look. When we looked at sperm production, we saw that one diploid germ cell gave rise to four haploid sperm. That's how normal meiosis occurs. Meiosis, or reduction division, is a type of nuclear division that also involves two rounds of cell division so that one cell becomes two and two become four. Now, the difference is with oogenesis, we have one diploid germ cell give rise to only one haploid gamete. Why? Well, let's look at this first division. At this first division, we do get an equal division of the nuclear material. We have one haploid nucleus and one haploid nucleus. However, we have a very unequal distribution of cytoplasm, all the extra stuff. So that we end up with one small cell called a polar body and one large cell called the secondary oocyte. It's the secondary oocyte that's released during the process of ovulation, but we'll get to that. Now, the secondary oocyte still has to go through another round of division to separate the two copies of the chromosomes that it has. It's haploid, but the chromosomes are in the duplicated state. So in the second round of meiosis, which interestingly enough doesn't occur until fertilization, we again get an uneven distribution of cytoplasm so that we end up with one small polar body and one large egg. Now, what's the significance of this? Well, let's think about it. What's all the other stuff in the egg? Well, there are ribosomes and uh, other cellular machinery, uh, raw materials, proteins, and amino acids, and all the other stuff and enzymes that the cell is going to need when we start up a new organism. But the sperm's bringing nothing to the party except for genetic material. So it's the egg that's going to, to have to have all the other stuff so that when this sperm, this haploid nucleus of the sperm, fuses with this haploid nucleus of the egg and we begin our new, uh, with our new zygote, we have enough material to start up. If we look back again quickly at how the sperm are formed, each of these haploid cells is very small and doesn't bring with it a lot of extra startup material. So it's, it's the egg's responsibility to not only provide half the genetic material, but all of the extra components of the cell, the cytoplasm, 
as the sperm is bringing none of that to them. Now, let's take a closer look at the ovary itself and the process by which uh, the ovarian cycle occurs. Now, here we have a primary oocyte inside of a follicle. The follicle is a jacket of cells that's going to nourish the, the oocyte as it matures. So every approximately 28 days, the ovarian cycle uh, occurs where one egg uh, goes through a process of maturation. The follicle grows. Inside that growing follicle is the egg. And at some point, that follicle ruptures and releases the oocyte in an event called ovulation. The secondary oocyte, which will be the egg, uh, is released. The cells that were the follicle become the, a structure called the corpus luteum or yellow body. Eventually the corpus luteum will break down and once it does will begin the process of maturing a new follicle. Now this cycle is under the con precise control of specific hormones. We'll get to the details of that in a moment. At the same time that the ovarian cycle is occurring and we release an egg, there's another cycle called the uterine cycle which is a sequence of building up and breaking down of the endometrium, the uterine wall. We need the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle to be in concert, to be coordinated, so that when the oocyte is released, that the endometrium is prepared for a possible pregnancy. So let's look at the overview of the menstrual cycle. This reoccurring pattern of varying hormone levels and tissue changes in females. It consists really of two parts, the ovarian cycle, the maturation and release of an egg um, in the follicle of the uterus, and the uterine cycle, the building up and breaking down of the endometrium wall. The timing and control of these two cycles is ultimately controlled by the hypothalamus and is under the influence of five different hormones, gonadotropin releasing hormone, FSH, LH, estrogen, and progesterone. We should name these gonadotropin releasing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone. Through a woman's lifetime, she will undergo four to five hundred of these cycles. Starting at puberty, which can be anywhere from age 10 to 16, and proceeding into the late 40s or early 50s, when a dwindling hormonal secretion uh, signifies the beginning of menopause. If we look at an overview of the menstrual cycle, it occurs in three phases. The follicular phase, where we have the follicle. Ovulation, the day we release the ovule. And the luteal phase, when the follicle which is now the corpus luteum, is producing and secreting high levels of progesterone. Since it is a cycle, it's hard to show where the beginning and end is. Anytime we have a cycle, where do we start and where do we end? For definition's sake, day one of our new menstrual cycle is the first day of flow, or menstruation, as the endometrium wall begins to break down. During the first few days of the menstrual cycle, that's what's occurring. At this, uh, also, uh, during this early stage, while we have a follicle, we are maturing a new, uh, a new oocyte, a new egg, and we start to actually rebuild the endometrium wall. That occurs for the next six days or so, and somewhere around day 14, or the middle of the cycle, we release an egg. By this point, the endometrium wall is built up enough that if a pregnancy were to occur, it could sustain that pregnancy. The luteal phase is when the corpus luteum, the cells that used to be the follicle, start to secrete and produce large amounts of progesterone and estrogen, which continues to thicken the endometrium wall and also sustains the endometrium wall. This will last for another uh, 14 days or so uh, until there either is or is not a pregnancy. And if there is not a pregnancy, the corpus luteum will break down, and then therefore the endometrium wall will break down, and therefore we will, uh, the levels of progesterone and estrogen will drop and we'll begin uh, a, new, a new phase. No, so that's our overview. I'm going to produce a second video where we go into the details of the menstrual cycle, looking at how each of these hormones interacts on each of these tissues.